Hey guys, so check this out. If SpaceX's Starship Block 2 version represents a technological leap in rocket technology, then the new launch pad is also a groundbreaking revolution in this field. Not only does it improve the speed and construction techniques, but the new launch pad advances towards an unprecedented design. It's even going to feature changes that we never dared to imagine. So, how has the upgraded launch pad evolved compared to the previous ones? In only four months, SpaceX rapidly and efficiently assembled its second launch tower. This new engineering structure serves as a milestone in the development of Starship's program, marking the beginning of a new era with more frequent launches. To complete the structure of a spaceport, SpaceX is continuing the construction of the orbital launch mount, which we'll call the OLM, and that plays a big role in this effort. The OLM is the foundational support system for Starship during launch and pre-launch operations. Its function extends beyond just providing stability. It also facilitates fueling pre-flight preparations and safety protocols, making it an essential component in SpaceX's mission to revolutionize space travel. As the company aims for ambitious goals, including colonizing Mars, OLM becomes even more important in supporting the operational demands of these frequent and complex spaceflights. Before, SpaceX's launch mount was a transitional structure fixed to the ground, but the design for the second launch pad incorporates some smart innovations. The traditional OLM was primarily designed to provide stability during launches, with its core function being to support the Starship rocket, assist with refueling, and manage pre-launch preparations. While effective, its fixed nature limits its adaptability and flexibility. Once the rocket gets launched, the structure remains in place, requiring extensive maintenance and refurbishments before it can get reused, potentially leading to longer downtimes between missions. Recognizing the need for a more dynamic system, SpaceX may have introduced the concept of a mobile OLM that offers potential benefits. Unlike its static predecessor, the mobile OLM can be repositioned, allowing for faster and more efficient maintenance without disrupting other launch operations. This flexibility could revolutionize SpaceX's launch operations by minimizing downtime and enabling a higher frequency of launches. So, why do I dare to speculate about this? Well, there are reasons for everything. Through the work being done by SpaceX's construction teams in preparing materials for the assembly of the launch pad, it's becoming clear components of the mount are being assembled in a distinctive square configuration, a noticeable departure from the traditional round ring design used in earlier launch systems. This square layout closely resembles the ship's transport stand, a mobile system that has already proven its worth in handling Starship prototypes. The similarity strongly suggests that the new OLM is being designed with mobility in mind. But if you're wondering about the other components of the previous OLM that we're used to seeing, like the piping of the booster quick disconnect system, how's that going to be designed to be mobile? The design of the mobile OLM will certainly not disappoint. The structure is expected to be more streamlined and simpler than traditional systems. One of the key improvements is in the booster's quick disconnect system. Instead of being directly attached to OLM, the QD could be placed closer to the launch tower, allowing for a more flexible connection process. As for the wire and piping associated with OLM, we've recently seen workers installing pipes in this section. These might be removable connections known as umbilicals running from the ground equipment to the vehicle. These detachable lines will be mounted on a support stand allowing easy repair or replacement if needed while also protecting fixed ground equipment from potential explosions or damage. This setup also creates more space around the launch area. All that's needed to attach to the mobile launch pad are clamps and a water system. As you can see, this simplifies things considerably, contrary to the complex ideas some people might have in mind. Another highly potential reason for the creation of a mobile version of the launch mount is the flame trench system beneath it. If the launch mount or pad is built traditionally, it would include a massive water-cooled steel plate system below to manage the heat. As we've seen with the first launch tower, this system has shown signs of wear and tear over time, raising concerns about its long-term effectiveness, especially under the harsh conditions of frequent launches. Therefore, SpaceX has explored the possibility of replacing the water-cooled steel plates with a more durable solution, the flame trench system. Flame trenches are designed to divert extreme heat and exhaust away from the launch pad, offering better durability across multiple launches. It's very similar to the flame trench system at the Massey Test Facility. However, for the super heavy booster of Starship, the system would need to be scaled up to handle the immense thrust and heat generated during liftoff.
As a result, the scale of this system at Pad B will be considerably larger. The infrastructure is currently developing at a rapid pace. Looking at the flame deflector SpaceX made at Massey as part of its static fire pad, we can see that after prelim work was completed, the main structure of the deflector was fully built in a short period. So it's possible that within the next one to two weeks, a true flame trench could emerge at Pad B, rather than just the wooden piles we've seen sticking out of the ground so far. And similarly to the test structure at Massey, SpaceX could have a mobile rocket stand offering a reliable and sustainable method that's already been proven. It's hard to predict exactly what this structure is going to look like in the end, but one thing is certain, it's going to be upgraded in a big time way. After all, the benefits of a mobile launch pad are just undeniable. The introduction of the mobile OLM has the potential to improve SpaceX's launch efficiency, especially when it comes to catching and positioning Starship using the chopstick system. In the current setup, the chopsticks, these large mechanical arms designed to catch and support Starship or its booster, must perform very complex maneuvers that align and adjust the rocket for catching. This process can be time-consuming and adds complexity to launch ops. With the mobility of the new OLM, the need for such complicated movements is greatly reduced. The OLM can reposition itself to the optimal spot for the chopsticks to catch the booster or starship, simplifying the entire process. By reducing the need for complex adjustments, SpaceX can streamline both the launch and recovery process, leading to smoother operations and quicker turnaround times between missions. This efficiency will be crucial as the company ramps up for more frequent launches, allowing for a more agile and responsive launch infrastructure that supports SpaceX's ambitious space exploration goals. Given SpaceX's already rapid pace, combined with the FAA's delay in approving Starship's fifth flight at Launch Pad A, it's likely that efforts and focus have shifted to completing the launch pad B. It's even possible that this pad could be ready before the fifth flight takes off. Honestly, for other launch service providers, it's typical to take years to build a launch pad from the start to the first launch. But SpaceX is always pushing to set new records. However, predictions about this OLM design are not without its challenges. One of the main concerns for the mobile OLM is ensuring the stability of the pad during the powerful launches of Starship, especially when we talk about the rocket's massive size and thrust. The super heavy booster of Starship generates tremendous force, requiring the launch pad to withstand significant mechanical stress while maintaining precise alignment. The mobile OLM must not only provide stability for the rocket during liftoff, but also manage these forces in a way that does not compromise safety or functionality. Still, SpaceX has a proven track record of overcoming technical challenges through innovation. The company has continually pushed the boundaries of space technology, solving problems that once seemed insurmountable. With extensive of experience developing and refining complex systems like Falcon 9 and Starship itself, SpaceX is well equipped to address concerns about the mobile OLM stability. They'll likely implement advanced engineering solutions to ensure the structural integrity and operational reliability of the pad, maintaining the safety and efficiency necessary for successful launches. This commitment and excellence in space operations is evident in the preparations for Starship's sixth flight, even as the fifth flight's delayed. Recently, on September 19th, SpaceX successfully conducted a static fire test for Ship 31, igniting all six Raptor engines. Additionally, Elon boldly declared on X, Flight 6 will be ready to fly before Flight 5 even gets approved by the FAA. This not only demonstrates SpaceX's speed and strength, but also mocks the FAA's delays in their processes. It also raises the possibility that Flight 6 could happen before Flight 5. As long as SpaceX does not attempt to catch Super Heavy, the FAA's previous launch license for Starship is still valid. However, that's just speculation, and we're probably going to have to wait for more updates from SpaceX. But in the meantime, SpaceX is continuing to push its program to the max. Before long, they'll have all the most advanced and remarkable upgrades in place, setting a pace that few companies can match. Upgrading OLM is a big improvement and an integral part of SpaceX's long-term vision for enabling sustainable human presence on Mars. Achieving the high-frequency, reliable launches needed to transport cargo, equipment, and eventually people to the Red Planet depends on the ability to efficiently turn around these missions. Mobile OLM is going to play a critical role in meeting these needs by enabling a quick and seamless preparation between each launch. 
the broader space community is closely watching the development of this new design. If successful, Mobile OLM could set a new standard for launch infrastructure, influencing the future of space exploration and industry. Its success would not only solidify SpaceX's leadership in space tech, but also accelerate the overall progress toward more ambitious space missions, fostering interest and collaboration across the global space industry. This is insane. Here's an image of Booster 11 after its final soft water landing following Starship's fourth flight. It's important to uncover everything that happened to the booster during the landing. So what's SpaceX going to do next with the B-11 shattered hardware? How did Elon react? In the past few days, the appearance of the 260-foot HOS Ridgewind service vessel off the coast of Boca Chica has garnered significant attention. This ship, equipped with a giant crane, has been hovering near the area where SpaceX's Starship booster sank into the Gulf of Mexico June 6th. The presence of the 260-foot Ridgewind has sparked speculation that Elon's commercial space company is recovering the 230-foot steel booster that hit the water, toppled over, and then sank. And yesterday, that's no longer speculation, as Elon himself posted a close-up photo of the shattered remains of Super Heavy's B-11 booster. Starship Super Heavy Booster Flight 4, it said. Known as Super Heavy Booster 11, its massive fuel tank and 33 engines sent a Starship upper stage into space during its fourth test flight back in June. This was the booster that did not explode before landing. Shortly after the flight, SpaceX said they have no plans to recover the spacecraft, but clearly the company or some other entity, maybe a wealthy collector, has had a change of heart about leaving the high-tech rocket parts out at sea. Take a closer look. The image truly gives off Star Destroyer wreckage vibes, like the ruins of a futuristic long-dead civilization, as Elon described it. We can no longer see the fuel tank or the 13 inner engines of the Super Heavy. All that remains are the 14 outermost Raptor 2 engines and the frame attached. This is likely the sturdiest part that connects the engines to the fuel tank. However, it's unclear whether the disintegration was due to the direct landing in the water or an explosion after B-11 hit the water as predicted by an image of a fire spotted by a space engineer. Saying it broke apart from the impact with the water isn't wrong as the Super Heavy rocket tipped in one direction upon landing and the pressure from the weight and the rocket's heat caused the part that made contact with the water first to crumble. But saying it exploded also makes some sense as just before B-11 neared the water, we saw a fire underneath the engines, particularly towards the outer ring of the engines. That would also explain why only half the engine stayed intact. What do you think caused such severe destruction to Super Heavy's B-11? Share your thoughts in the comments below. Recovering the parts of B-11 would give SpaceX an advantage in studying what happened to the remaining components, which would help prepare for the upcoming fifth flight when SpaceX aims to land Super Heavy once again and possibly catch it when it comes down with Mechazilla. This rocket still has much room for improvement, as Elon tweeted. Fix her upper. It shows that although Starship may not be perfect yet, it's a work in progress with immense potential. Now, with more than two months left before getting the FAA license at the end of November, we believe this time frame is sufficient for SpaceX to learn many lessons. It's undeniable that SpaceX is likely to introduce some changes to Super Heavy B-12. The idea of retrieving old rockets from the ocean is not new. In 2021, HOS Briarwood, a ship similar to the one currently 15 miles off Boca Chica Beach, helped SpaceX recover parts of Falcon 9's rocket off the coast of Florida. Further back, NASA recovered nearly half the Challenger after the explosion in 86, in which seven astronauts lost their lives. In 2013, Jeff Bezos, CEO of Amazon and founder of Blue Origin, led an expedition to collect the charred mechanical parts from the Saturn V rocket that carried Apollo astronauts to the moon in the late 60s and 70s. Some artifacts are on display in the Seattle Museum of Flight and the National Air and Space Museum in D.C. This suggests that not only has the tail section of the B-11 been recovered, but SpaceX is likely continuing to look for more. The excitement is building, and we can't wait for what's next. While the excitement from recovering the rocket offshore still lingers, SpaceX continues ramping up its operations at Starbase on land. Previously, we speculated Flight 6 might take off before Flight 5 based on Elon's tweets, but just the day after the 20th of September, B-12, part of Flight 5, along with its hot staging section, was moved to the launch site. Once there, it was immediately secured using the chopsticks, and on the morning of the 20th, it was placed on the Orbital Launch Mount, or OLM. Notably, the lifting of Booster 12 was done in a special manner. Typically, we only see the chopsticks lift super heavy and put it on the OLM, but this time SpaceX lifted it all the way to the top of the tower before lowering it. This is the first time Super Heavy hit such a height, and it's almost certain that the rocket will be caught at that height. Just as SpaceX tweeted, Starbase Tower lifts the Super Heavy booster for Flight 5 to expected catch height. Accompanying the tweet were stunning images, the likes of which we haven't seen in some time.
Upon closer inspection, it's clear that the inner stage booster rings missing from the top is super heavy, which is not surprising as the Starship launch profile involves SpaceX discarding the booster ring into the ocean before the rocket does a soft landing. This ring was a late add-on to Starship's design and one of the first upgrades after Flight 1 last year, which ended with the Starship's first and second stages failing to separate. After B-12 got put on the OLM, the hot staging section was added. By the end of September 21st, Ship 30 was transposed to the launch pad at Starbase. SpaceX announced the event on social media, emphasizing its importance. Ship 30 had undergone static fire tests and had an upgraded heat shield. Spacecraft's fully equipped with Raptor engines, promising improved navigation, deceleration, and landing capabilities compared to previous versions. With both B-12 and Ship 30 now at the launch pad, we could soon witness the first fully integrated prototype stack. Normally, the next step be a wet dress rehearsal, a critical pre-launch test. However, given the current situation and the FAA's review process, the timeline could be delayed. Elon has hinted that these activities might be to demonstrate SpaceX's readiness to the FAA. In addition to SpaceX's own efforts, more and more congressional efforts are coming forward to support SpaceX, urging the FAA to expedite the approval process for Starship flights. These include Congressman Kevin Kiley of California and Keith Self, a congressman of Texas, and even Donald Trump. Starship must be launched, and the U.S. needs to return to the moon before China does. This is no idle time for SpaceX or NASA, especially when NASA's Artemis lunar program is facing issues with its contractor Axiom. A detailed report reveals Axiom Space is facing financial challenges. Sources indicate that the company struggling to make payroll has fallen behind on payments to contractors, including SpaceX, and started downsizing operations. This comes at a time when external funding is becoming increasingly scarce. Last month, Axiom's longtime CEO and co-founder, Mike Suffredini, abruptly stepped down, citing personal reasons. He transitioned to an advisory role and will remain on the board. A new report suggests that Suffredini built Axiom into a mini-NASA-like entity, burdened with unnecessary costs. The company is now facing financial strain, with delays and downsizing threatening the viability of its space station projects. The report states, Axiom found itself struggling to make payroll, which reached $10 million a month by early last year, according to an internal document, and it fell behind on payments to suppliers. Axiom's primary goal was to build a commercial low-Earth orbit space station by leveraging NASA's ISS. The station would consist of several modules for crew quarters, power research, and manufacturing. Once fully assembled, it would detach and become an independent free-flying station. However, building and managing a space station takes time and expertise. In the interim, Axiom launched private astronaut missions to the ISS, targeting billionaires and wealthy nations. The company also secured funding from NASA to develop an EVA suit for Artemis' lunar missions. NASA awarded Axiom hundreds of millions of dollars to start suit development, selecting the company alongside Collins Airspace, which has since dropped out, leaving Axiom as the sole competitor. These initiatives will require billions to develop, but NASA has only provided a fraction of the necessary funds. Additionally, Axiom's private astronaut missions have operated at a loss. A former exec noted, there aren't many billionaires willing to spend 18 months training to become an astronaut for the ISS. To make matters worse, NASA mandates that a former NASA astronaut command each private mission, reducing Axiom's revenue from each mission by approximately 25%. The company expects its next mission in early 2025 to break even. On a more positive note, Axiom's spacesuit program is reportedly in better shape thanks to steady NASA funding and a strong chance of becoming the sole provider unless SpaceX steps in. Despite raising half a billion dollars in a recent funding round, Axiom's financial situation stays precarious. As soon as the money comes in, it went straight to paying SpaceX and other bills. Then it was gone, a former exec told Forbes. Under interim CEO and co-founder Kim Gafarian, the company has implemented layoffs, a voluntary 20% pay cut for employees, and talks about scaling back its space station plans. With continued delays to Axiom Station's first launch and the ISS set to retire by the end of the decade, any reduction in scope puts Axiom's core mission at risk. If the company's primary goal of building an LEO station falters, its future becomes uncertain. A potential lifeline could come from a NASA contract to provide a replacement for the ISS, but Axiom faces stiff competition from companies like Vast, Blue Origin, Sierra Space, and even SpaceX with Starship. Whatever the outcome, Axiom faces a tough road ahead to turn its business model into a commercial success. And that's it for today's episode. Thanks for watching and see you next time.